Hey, Way family, thank you for tuning in. God has an amazing word for you, so go ahead and check out this message. And after, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love you. God bless. For these next four weeks, we're going to give you stories just like you heard today about lives that have been transformed. You don't want to miss it. And our role that we are life changers. Say, say with me, I'm a life changer. And we could bring about life change everywhere we go. Let's turn right now to Luke chapter 5, verse 17. And we're going to focus on a story in the Bible about a man that was hopeless, paralyzed, and there was some friends that supported him, r rallied around him, and they allowed him to experience life transformation. It would have never happened if his friends weren't there. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now what happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The scripture starts out with a statement. Now it happened. And when I'm thinking, what happened? Something happened in this story, but it starts out with it happened. The word it is an interesting word because it could describe something that happened in the past. It could describe something that's happening in the present. It could also describe something that's happening in the future. So this scripture is saying something happened and I'm interested in finding out what happened. Jesus is teaching, but something stands out in this portion of scripture that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power was there to set them free. The power was there to deliver. The power was there to give someone a brand new start. The power was there to give someone joy. The power was there to restore a relationship. The power was there to raise the dead. The power was present to heal. This scripture is now referring to power. And I want to, we're going to find out what happened, but it's referring to the source or the power that made it happen. So a miracle happened in this portion of scripture. We're going to find out what miracle happened, but it happened because the power was present to heal them on a certain day. Say it with me, on a? The word certain day or or day, it's real simple, it's just, it means this, only one day, only one day. See, God will do more in one day than you could do in a lifetime. What he's saying, what happened only happened in one day. It didn't take a week, it didn't take a year, it didn't take a whole bunch of treatments, it happened in only one day. The word certain, that certain day also means the other, uh, uh, the other day. Have you ever said that? The other day something happened. And all it means is this, that any day something like this can happen. A certain day, only one day, the other day, any day. It also means the first day. Why does it say the first day? Because when God does something, he could change your life and give you a brand new beginning. And it could be the first day of the rest of your life. This certain day, this day, right here, right now, the power is present. Come on, the power is present. The, this day, the power is present to do a miracle, transform your life, and this could be your brand new beginning. Will someone claim that for themselves? A shift, a shift. On a certain day, something happened. It will no longer be the same as it was. Something happened because the power of God was present. Now, not necessarily that everybody that was present got a breakthrough. 
because it, it doesn't mean just because there's a big crowd that the whole crowd is going to get it. But there's a group of people that are desperate in a crowd. They're, they're, they're searching. They have a vision. They're not just showing up to show up. They're showing up because they believe that today the power of God is present to do what they couldn't do in a lifetime. It said the power of the Lord. Why the power of the Lord was present. It wasn't just power was present. The power of the Lord was present. That's an important point. Because it's so, we're so quick to focus on our own power. Our own abilities. Our own giftings. And the more I look at myself, the less adequate I feel. The more overwhelmed I am. Because I realize that the vision and the things I want to see God do in my life, I don't have the ability to do them on my own. God's not giving you a vision of a better life for you to focus on your ability. He's giving you a vision of a better life for you to focus on his ability. It doesn't mean, I want you to just because it's always been the way it's been doesn't mean it needs to be the same. Come on, it doesn't need to remain the same as it's always been. Something happened. So how did it happen? And before I dive into that, I want you to declare this. Something is happening. Something's going to happen. Something has happened. I am in this story. I love this because God is saying, I'm doing something now. I'm doing something there. I'm doing something in the past. I am, I've already done something. I'm always up to something. God does not release his power unless he wants to get something or make something happen. So how did it happen? It happened because the power to make it happen was present. The word power means this, strength was available. And it wasn't just human strength, it was supernatural strength. The Bible says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. God wants us to focus not on our own ability, our own might, our own force, our own bank accounts, our, our own, come on, our own experience, our own resumes. He wants us to focus on his power, his dunamis power, his strength. Strength, strength. It also means ability, not our ability, his ability. Oh, I'm dependent on his ability. That's great. I love that. It means power for performing miracles. A miracle is something that you can't explain. A matter of fact, you can't do it. God is the one that specializes in miracles and you specialize in doing things in the natural. God says, you do your part, I'll do my part. You pray for somebody, I will heal them. You speak the gospel, I will save them. You give and I will multiply. You do your part, God says, I'll do my part. Miracles. Miracles, the power to perform miracles. The power and influence which belongs to riches, to belong to riches and wealth. Now, it's, this is called influence. We were just talking in the back and we're talking about Kanye West. He just gave his life to the Lord and he just put an album out, Jesus King. And the album's amazing. Even if you don't like hip hop, have some gospel on there. But he's going on, he just said the other day, he goes, I dedicate my life to preaching the gospel and to building the church. For the rest of my life, that's all I'm going to do. He goes, I make clothes that will have John 3.16 on it. I'll put scriptures on it. But never ever will I do anything without the purpose of preaching the gospel and building the church. That's what he said the other day. Now, why is this all important? Because we were talking about and say, man, he has such great influence. 
and Brad Pitt just did, rededicated his life to the Lord. He just gave a testimony. I've done everything and there's something missing in my life. And I realized what's missing is how I got brought up as a Christian. I left my faith. I need Jesus back in my life. Brad Pitt just gave his life to the Lord. He's given testimony. Hulk Hogan just gave it, rededicated his life to the Lord. And he said, I apologize for being a bad example because I knew better. But now I made up my mind. I'm going to live for God. and I'm going to represent him for the rest of the days of my life. God is doing something right now. We were just talking about it. Man, it would be great to have Brad Pitt come. And then Robert said, but only girls will show up. He goes, and Robert goes, imagine if he came, we'd have a whole bunch of girls lined up for prayer. And then, and then one of our brothers in the back, he says, you don't need Brad Pitt. And you don't even need Kanye West to get this job done. Because you already have the power through the Holy Spirit. Because your influence, the power, the influence of the rich, come on, the influence of the wealthy, you already got it. God is saying that kind of influence, I give it to you. The power is present to influence anybody. Isn't that great? It means power and resources from numbers. Power and resources. All the resources you need to fulfill the vision. God says, I give you that too. I love that. The power to heal is present. To heal, to cure, to make whole. To free from errors and sins. To bring about one's salvation. What he's saying is, when the, when the scripture said the power to heal is there, it meant this, the power to make someone whole is there. We think just physical healing, and Jesus is thinking deeper than that. He's thinking about spiritual healing. Spiritual healing is way more important than physical healing. You could be in this room right now and get a checkup and pass with flying colors, but it doesn't mean you're healthy. You could have all kinds of turmoil within you, depression within you, anger within you, unforgiveness and bitterness. That's a sickness too. And the greatest sickness that we have is a lifestyle of sin that we can't break away from. Have you ever been addicted to a bad thought? Addicted to bad behavior? Addicted to something that you know this is wrong? It's taking control of my life. It's hindering me from moving forward and accomplishing the purpose for my life. Something inside of me is stopping me. It's sickness. It means it's not operating the way it should. It's not healthy. And every single one of us, apart, apart from God, separated from God, are not healthy. So when Jesus said, or the scripture says here, that the power to heal was there, he said the power to forgive you is here. The power to break the power of the past is here. The power to give you a brand new start is here. The power to save you and give you eternal life is here. The power to renew your mind and renew your life and refresh your life is here. Salvation is here. Now Jesus is the power that was present. Say it with me. Jesus was the power that was present. And I love this because the power that was present there is also present here. And the power that was present there is present everywhere you go. Because as a believer, God gave you the power. He filled you with the same power, the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time for us to wake up and realize when we show up, we show up with the power and the power is present to heal, deliver, and set people free. Say it with me, I got the power. Of course you do. If you have Jesus, right? Where Jesus is present, the power is present because he's almighty God. Look how he transfers it to us in John 14, 13 and 14. He's transferring his power. And it says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name as my representatives. 
I want you to understand you are here to represent me. I want to change lives. I want to heal people. I want to set them free. I want to feed the hungry. I want to buy a foster home for children that are being aged out, that have, they're being aged out into homelessness. This is one of our initiatives for 2020. And I want you to think about this. There's foster children that have been rejected their whole lives. And think about this. Mama is no there, not, not there. But dad's not there either. But it goes deeper than that. Not only is mama not there, not only is dad not there, no one in the family wanted them. These young kids growing to teenagers, and by the time they age out at the age of 18, this is what happens to them. I already, they, were, they, they went through three homes at least in their life. They went to one home, rejected. Second home, rejected. Third home, rejected. And they get to the point that nobody wants them now. And at 18 years old, a lot of them are going to be pushed out into the street with no high school diploma, no gainful employment, with no family support. They're on the streets right now, and a lot of them are homeless. Most of them will become criminals, and the young ladies will just try to find a guy, and they'll just end up pregnant. They'll be single moms when it's all said and done, trying to find a way to survive, rejected their whole lives. And I thought about that. This is one of our initiatives. In 2020, we want to buy a house, and it might be one of the only houses in America that's going to be a discipleship house for foster children that have been rejected their whole lives. And we're going to say, maybe that gap, the government can't fill, but we're going to fill it. The kingdom government is going to fill it. And we're going to buy a house. This is what perfect worship is. Can we walk by a need that God presents to us and act like we didn't see it? and go on to dinner and go on to lunch and go on and do our thing in life and act like there's not a suffering group out there. We are here to fill those gaps with the love of Jesus Christ. Maybe they've been rejected by the world, but there's a kingdom in heaven that says, I haven't forgot about you and I'm raising up a church that's gonna build a house so you can transition and have family and have community have a church that you could be part of. A house like that would cost us right around 350000 to 450000 We need to get that house. And we need to pay for a cash. God told me, do not put them in, in a house that's not debt free. They've been under bondage far too long. I want them to be in a free environment. Man, come on, are we with this? I'm going to ask you on December 15th for all of us to participate in expansion of this church to reach more people. And if we don't expand our giving, we can't expand our reach. And all of us can just do our part. That's one of the initiatives. How many believe that we could get this initiative done and get those kids, come on, that are being aged out and say, we... And if you're not moved by this, then you shouldn't give to it. But if you are moved to buy it, then God's telling you, come on, I'm, I, I am talking to you because it's my vision. And if, if it resonates in your heart, God's saying, be part of it. So on December 15th, we're going to do this every single year. We're going to have an end of the year offering to prepare us for expansion. And why are we going to do this? Because every year we're going to be expanding. But I also believe this, every year you're going to be expanding. I believe God's going to expand your resources. God's going to expand, come on, your, and come on, your wisdom. God's going to expand your ability to, to attract wealth for the kingdom of heaven because God wants to reach more people. Are you with me? The power is present to do whatever God asks us to do. Look at this. And I will do whatever you ask in my name as my representatives. This I will do. So the Father may be glorified and, 
and celebrate it in the sun. Verse 14, John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I'm transferring the power to you. As my representatives, I will do it. That name that brought the power and made the power present in this story and made a miracle happen, God says, you have the same name. It's the name of Jesus. And you could ask me for anything as my representative here on earth, and I will give it to you to fulfill my assignment. I love this. It happened. It happened because the power to make it happen was present. Number two, it happened because someone cared enough to make it happen. It happened because someone cared enough to make it happen. Someone had to care enough for us to get a women's home for Annette. And I remember when we began to open up women's homes and, and men's homes, we stretched. I was selling my house. I was, we we're doing everything we could to expand this ministry. Sacrifices were being made so complete strangers can get a breakthrough. Because that could have been my five daughters, one of my five daughters. That could be your son. That could be your daughter. That could be your mama. And if it isn't, thank the Lord that you're in a position to make sure that when the other one was abandoned that, and your daughter's being taken care of, don't take it for granted. Because thank God you got your house together. But not everybody has their house together. And if we do have our house together, let's give an offering to thank God for all the good he has done. It's true. It happened because someone cared enough to make it happen cared enough to sacrifice their time, their energy, and resources to bring about a life change. In Luke 5, 18, we're on the second verse, we're finding out what happened. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed. Men brought a man. People reach people. There aren't, there aren't any angels coming down to do this for us. If we're going to have a men's home, a women's home, a foster home, it will only happen because men and women of God are doing what they can to bring people paralyzed, sick, hurting, helpless. They couldn't do it on their own. He couldn't come to Jesus on his own. He was paralyzed. Breakthrough was right around the corner, but he couldn't get there. Healing was available, but he couldn't walk. He was in a hopeless situation. And I'm thinking about it. How many people walk by him, probably begging on the streets, alms for the poor? There's no welfare system back in those days. There's no disability back in those days. Where's his family? I'm not sure he had any family. Because it says some brothers, his dad, his sister, but just some men. Some men heard and they probably saw that paralytic day after day after day. But then they heard also something. They heard that Jesus was coming to town. And Jesus had a reputation to be able to heal and do miracles and do the impossible. It's very important. If we're going to see another life change, we got to stop walking by the hurt around us. Stop being oblivious to all the depression and all the suicidal thoughts and all the hurt and all the poverty and just say, well, it's none of my business. It is our business because when they're hungry and we feed them, Jesus said, when you were hungry and you fed me, you did it to me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you came to me. When I was a stranger, you took me in. 
And when, we did do, when did we do that? When you did it to one of the least of them. The people that most people are ignoring and walking by, those least people that no one invites to dinner because they smell, they're hurting, they're helpless, and if you did help them, they can't help you. God is saying when you did it to them, I know you did it to me because you did it with the right motive. There was a paralyzed man. Somehow these men are highlighted in scripture. It doesn't give names to them because it doesn't matter. Do you see yourself in the story? Somewhere you're in this story, maybe you're the paralytic and someone brought you here today. You've been wanting to change and say, I can't get out of my own way. My world's falling apart. I feel like I'm stuck. Maybe you're the paralytic today. But thank God for your mama, for your friend, for your relative that kept hounding you. Come on, I got a place where you're going to hear a word and you're going to hear a message and it's going to change your life. Come on, husband. Your wife's been praying for you and she brought you here not for you to just come. She brought you here to get an encounter with God that you've been looking for. There's something missing. Or maybe you're the friends in this story. I'm laying my life down. I'm sacrificing my life to bring just one more soul to Jesus. Because if we don't bring them, they're not coming because they can't. If we don't open the foster home, they're not coming. There's no place for them. If we don't open up the women's home, they're not coming. If we don't have our downtown campus that's giving out food every single day, they're not coming. But we're making a way for them to come. And we got a food warehouse that we purchased last year that we're remodeling right now. It's going to probably cost us another $100,000 to fix it and finish it. Say, Pastor, why do we have that, that firehouse that's going to be a food warehouse? Because God is getting ready this next year of 2020. It's going to be the biggest harvest year of souls that the world has ever seen. God told me I'm putting my people in place. Even Kanye is in place. Brad Pitt's getting in place. You're in place. You're here this Sunday. There's something happening. You were, you were, some of you woke up this morning. You weren't even thinking about coming to church, but something told you, you got to get to the house of God because I got something for you. I'm putting you in place for this next move of God. My, the greatest harvest that we've ever seen is going to come in 2020. He goes, you need a warehouse. You don't need a warehouse for what you're doing. You need a warehouse for where you, what you're going to be doing. Can't you see I'm doing something new? They brought a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. That word sought means that they set a goal. They had a desire to bring him to Jesus. They brought him. See, nothing is going to happen unless someone cares enough to take action. Nothing's going to happen. Because we got to stop thinking this. Someone's going to do it. We got to start saying this. I'm going to do it. Someone's going to give. No, say, I'm going to give. Someone's going to serve. No, I'm going to serve. Someone's going to do Bible studies with them and disciple them. No, I'm going to do Bible studies and disciple them. I'm going to have my power 12. I'm going to invest my Tuesday afternoons with someone that's hurting and they need some training, discipleship and care. I'm going to do it. Not somebody. It's me. These men finally had to say, it's me. No one's going to take them if we don't take them. And I can hear the conversations like, he's heavy though. Or maybe something like this, it's hot. Can we just do it on another day when it cools down a little bit? The weather isn't right to take him now. He's going to get sunburned. Another says, I don't feel like I'm strong enough to hold him. I don't know what they were saying. Maybe they said, but it's so far. That's a long walk. It's a long walk just walking, but carrying dead weight. That's hard. How much does he weigh? 
Could we just weigh him right now? I wonder how many excuses, how many thoughts, and I wonder how many other people God told, take them, there's the answer, take them, there's freedom, take them, there's healing, and they talked themselves right out of it, but there's a group of people, and it might only be a few of them, but they're saying, I'm not going to be talked out of it, I can't walk by someone that's hurting and act like I didn't see it. No longer are we doing church as usual. We're going to do more together. That's why God has brought us together. All of us together can reach thousands of people. It happened because they had faith in Jesus. They really believed that Jesus could, could, and would. They really believed that Jesus could and would heal him. Jesus used their faith as a conduit to forgive and heal the paralyzed man. Look at this. Luke chapter 5 verse 18 says this. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. See, it takes great faith to press through ob obstacles to help somebody. It takes great faith to press through all the obstacles that you're going through to even get here today. This is part of worship. But another part of worship is our giving. Another part of worship is our service. Let's worship. When they could not find how, to, how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop. So they finally get to the location carrying the paralyzed man, they get to the door and there's crowds of people around this house. And they're trying, I want you to tell how selfish the crowd was. They wouldn't even let the paralyzed guy through. The crowd was in the way of their vision to help somebody. Why am I saying that? Be careful that you stop doing what God calls you to do because someone's in the way. Don't let the crowd offend you. Don't let the people stop you. If God's giving you a vision, he's going to help you fulfill it. Don't let people be your excuse of why you're not doing what God has asked you to do. When my husband gets right, when my wife gets right, when my kids get right, when the church gets right. So you mean you need everybody right to do what's right. And God's saying, it doesn't matter if nobody gets right. I'm going to still give you a call, and it might look like it's impossible. And just because there's obstacles doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So they couldn't find a way to get him in because of the crowd, because of the crowd. It's so easy to talk ourselves out of it right there. See, if it was God's will, he would have made a way where there was no way. He parted the Red Sea. Why didn't he just part that crowd? <laughs> but imagine having to tell that guy, say, look, we thought we we're going to be able to get contact with Jesus. It's just impossible right now. There's a crowd. We've already said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. The crowds won't let us through. So we're going to go back home and drop you off at that corner so you could beg. Okay, we tried, though. You understand? It's the thought that counts. And we're kind of tired. See if you could get a ride back over there. I just thought about it. <laughs> we don't want to drop you. It's all right. It's far. You know, that's not a bad place to beg. Just stay right here. <laughs> we justify not helping people. We justify not giving. We justify not tithing. We just justify it. But you're justifying yourself out of your purpose. You're justifying yourself out of the miracle. So... What did they do? They went on the rooftop. It don't matter if there's obstacles. It might get a little harder, but it's okay. But we're not leaving without the healing. We're not leaving without the breakthrough. We're not leaving without the freedom. We're not leaving. Come on. We're not leaving without the wisdom. We are coming and we're getting every single thing that God promised us. We came here for a healing. Buddy, we're going to have to climb down. Maybe you're at the point of your miracle 
where you thought it was going to get easier and it just got harder. And it just got harder because you're closer than you've ever been. Maybe there's been a spirit trying to push you out of the church, trying to push you out of ministry, trying to push you out of your family, trying to push you out of your relationships, and you feel like there's a push trying to push you out. But God is saying, don't let him push you out because there's a spirit that knows you're real close to Jesus. You're real close to your breakthrough. You're real close to the dream and the vision coming to pass. Press in. Don't press out. So they climb up. Now that must have been harder. How are we going to get them up there? And just imagine that conversation. So what are we going to do now? And then someone comes up with a bright idea. Well, there's nobody on the roof. What do you mean, man? What I was thinking, I don't know if it's a good idea, but, but we could, I was thinking we could take them, put them on the roof. But he's heavy, though. He's heavy. I know, but I think if we got some, maybe some help around here, maybe we could lift them up, put them on the roof. So what happens when you put them on the roof? We'll just break a hole in the roof and just drop them in. And then, and then they, they said, that's a great idea. How come I didn't think of that? See, God is looking for some people that are creative. God is looking for some people, come on, that have, are determined. God is looking for some people that have enough faith to say, you know what, I'm going to think outside the box. God wants to do something big, and I'm ready to do something that no one has ever done to get a breakthrough like no one has ever seen. They didn't have a scripture to refer to. Drop the guy from the roof. But they do this. We're going to get him to Jesus. We came here with a desire and an aim and a goal. We're going to get him to Jesus. Our kids will serve God. Come on. Our family, that's for our, me and my house, will serve the Lord. We'll fulfill our purpose. We will be in ministry. We will give. We will do it. Are we determined as much as they were to build our foster home? We've got to be determined. Look at this, and it says, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tile, tiling into the mist before Jesus. <laughs> I don't even know how they pulled him down. But they somehow found a way to break open that roof, and I could just see Jesus speaking, and then boom, hammers, I get that. I can imagine the whole crowd just looking up and the owner of the house, what's happening here? Well, that's what happens when you get Jesus in the middle of your house. Come on, God's going to start rearranging some stuff. God's going to start making room for more miracles. And some of you right now, it looks like it's all falling apart, but it's just a new construction that God is doing to make room, to make a hole, to do more ministry. This is not a teardown. Come on, this is a remodel. After it was done, they had a skylight. <laughs> but they dropped them in. And I want you to think about it. Can you see them dropping them in? And can you see the whole crowd that stuffed in that house and they rejected the paralytic from coming in? They're seeing faith like they've never seen. They got them in. And now Jesus is stopping everything. He's stopping his speech. He's stopping his teaching. And he says, enough teaching, now demonstration. You know what I said? Enough talking. It's time to start walking. Come on. We need some love that has some action to it. We need some faith that has some action. We need some faith that's even sacrificial. I'm willing to do what I can. Right? So they drop them. And look what the Bible says. When he saw their faith, he said to him, man, <laughs> your sins are forgiven you. And I could hear the people say, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't come here for that. We came here for healing. That's what, that's what I'm sure the men were saying. We came here for healing. And Jesus is saying, I, I, I want you to get this. I could heal. That's not a problem. I'm doing the biggest miracle right now. See, what I, when I looked at him, I saw his greatest need. You think his greatest need was for his limbs to work. His greatest need 
was his spiritual condition. He was separated from me. He was hurting. He was broken. He was lost for eternity. So I'm going to handle what's first, and then we'll get to what's second. But number one is not to fix the physical problems, not to fix your marriage. It's to God, to allow God to fix you. We want everything fixed on the outside, and God says, nah, because even if I fix it on the outside, it's still temporary. What I'm looking at is to fix the eternal stuff, to make sure that when you die, you'll be with me for eternity. I didn't come here just to fix people, temporary issues. I came here to fix their eternal destination, and I want you. You know what's missing? You're paralyzed on the inside. You're paralyzed on the outside, but the paralyze, the being paralyzed started what's going on on the inside. Inside, and now it's affecting what's on the outside. You never got over your hurt. You never got over your pain. You never got over your anger. And now you have a paralysis within you. And God says, let me fix that. And then we can start working on the other stuff that are symptoms. Your sins are forgiven. Now, I'll tell you this. When, what's that happen? The religious people got all mad. Well, who does he think he is? Does he think he's, did he think he's God? Only God could forgive sins. Well, they had it right. Only God could forgive sins, but they had it wrong. They didn't know God was there. And this is the problem, just like faith can make it happen. Faith can cause a miracle, doubt, can make, make, I want you to, doubt can stop it from making, ha for, it, for it happening for you. Even though the power to heal and forgive and save was there, those guys that were doubting and reasoning a miracle away didn't get anything. There's a thought process here. Either you're believing in Jesus or you're doubting. And if you're doubting Jesus, it's the issue. You're not going to see the miracle. You're not going to see the healing. You're not going to see the power and you'll never be forgiven and you'll never have eternal life. And if there's a thought of doubt that's rising up, push that thought down and say, I'm tired of doubting. Because in doubting, there's no hope. In doubting, things that say, say the same. I'm tired, as, I'm, tired, I'm tired of it being the way it's always been. Something has to change. And I heard a message that the power is present to heal, to set me free. I need change. I came here for a deliverance. I came here for a change. I came here for a breakthrough. I came here for God to turn my world upside down and I'm not leaving until I get it. And it happened. The guy was forgiven, but look, it happened. The guy was also healed in every way. He was made whole inside and out. First inside, then out. Let's stop trying to serve God from the outside in. Come God, to God with your problems and have him fix your branches instead of dealing with your roots. God is saying, I'm tired of dealing with symptoms because if you don't deal with the root, the symptoms keep coming back. And what happens when we got, we got branch Christians, this is what they do. They come, they get a little better, and then they exit stage left. Because they don't realize that they need to stay connected. Come on. They need to stay grounded. They need to stay in place. It's not going from church to church, from ministry to ministry. It's time to get your roots in the house of God so every branch is healthy and blessed. It's time to stop running and it's time to start getting planted. And Luke 5, 23. Which is easier, Jesus said. Because these, these naysayers, religious people say, who do you think he is? And the Bible says Jesus perceived their thoughts. Like, he knew what they were thinking. He saw the faith of the men that dropped them. They didn't say anything, but he saw their faith by their action. But he also heard their thoughts. And he began to address it. Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Why are you doubting and trying to figure all this out in the physical? This is a spiritual thing. And then Jesus says, which is easier, say your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? He's talking to these guys that are doubting. Which one's easier, guys? Sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Which one do you think is easier? Do you think rise up and walk's easier? It is easier. Because the forgiveness only God can do. But what, what I'm going to show you that I have power and authority to forgive sins. I'm going to show you who I am right now. 
because it was so cool about this story is Jesus is still reaching out to the naysayers. He's reaching out to the doubters. He's not there. He's not there to hurt them. He's there to build them. He says, you don't, still don't believe me. Let me give you a little more evidence of who I am. You know what's so good about God? He doesn't give up on you. It's not that you love God, it's that He loves you. He loves you while you're turning your back on Him. He loves you while you said you're an atheist. He loves you while you don't want nothing to do with the church and God. He loved you while you were being a hater. He goes, I, you can hate me all you want, you can fight me all you want, but you're not gonna win this fight. I will keep chasing you down and I'll keep proving myself to you over and over and over until you finally come on, surrender. Then we serve a good God, come on. Rise up and walk. But the, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to them, he wanted to prove himself to them, which is great. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I forgave you, which I did the biggest miracle. You're saved. You have eternal life now. But let's just do, let's just do a bonus right now. Thank God for your haters. They're going to cause some miracles in your life. There's some people rooting against you. And God says, because they're rooting against you, I'm going to show them how powerful I am. When you got a little resistance in your life, God's ready to do some big things in your life. Don't get mad at your haters. Just get ready for a big breakthrough in your life. What areas that they're looking at, that they're saying is a weakness, God's going to turn it all around, do a miracle, and you're going to walk like you've never walked, talk like you never talked, and you're going to have to give glory to God. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, this is in the crowd, take up your bed and go to your house. Now, again, the paralyzed guy could have said, but I can't walk. And start talking himself out of a miracle. You got to stop talking yourself out of a miracle. Tithe. I, I can't. You can't. You can't. I'm telling you to do it. And if I tell you to do it, I'll give you the power to do it. We're done. Look at this. Immediately, he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Something happened. A man that was paralyzed his whole life was forgiven, was set free, was made whole, and he left. He came with depression, he came with bondage, he came with his disability, and he left with his bed, the thing that was carrying him, he was now having authority over, and he was going back to his house, praising God for what God did on a certain day because of some certain friends that were willing to sacrifice to make sure their friend got a life change. Let's give God some praise and you got that for you. Let's give God some praise. Say it with me, I'm a life changer. We're going to do our, our tithes and offerings now. This is the beginning of the month. And the Bible says this, this is real cool. He says, bring your tithes into the storehouse, which is his, his treasury. What is the storehouse of what? It's a treasure. Someone say treasury. His church, it should be a place of treasure. Someone needs a breakthrough, boom, they come here. Someone needs food, they come here. It's a source. He goes, and it, he goes, try me now in this. He goes, try it, even if you're scared right now. The paralyzed man probably was scared when he said, rise up and walk, like, ah. Oh. But you know what he had to do because he believed? Was take action. And faith without action is the problem. It doesn't release power. So when you release, release by obedience and you take action, and for some of you, this might be your first time you ever tithe, you're gonna break something in your life. You're gonna break a pattern of thinking. And I want you to get this. If you're in a pattern of I can't or I won't, you're not in the pattern of thinking that will lead you to more than you have. Someone said train of thought. So this is when we bring our tithes, this is what he does. He says, I'll open up windows, the window, I'll open up the window of heaven, 
and then I'll pour out a blessing on you that's so great, you won't have enough to hold it. You know what he's saying is, I've all, when I bless, I bless in abundance. And I bless in abundance, there's a reason I do it, so you have overflow. And I want you to have overflow so you could change more lives. When Peter was at the boat, he was fishing all night, didn't catch anything. Jesus took his boat and took it out there. He goes, let's go out one more time. And he says, and then he goes, now drop your nets right now. Fishing all night catches nothing on his own ability. He drops his nets. He starts filling his boat as he obeys God, drops his nets, gives his tithes, gives an offering, starts serving, does what God tells him, pick up your bed, start walking, go home. He didn't go another place. He went home. God told him to go home. He went home. He did it exactly what God told him and he started getting the results God had planned for him. So when you do it, Peter catches the fish. There's so many fish that he can't hold them. It's overflow. I'll open up the windows. He has to call his friends over. Hey, bros. Hey, bros, come over here. Bring your boats out here. We catch, I caught so many fish. There's still fish here. Come do it. Because when God does a breakthrough, he does a breakthrough that there's an overflow on your breakthrough. So you can have overflow to bless more people. Say with me, I'm a life changer. I'm not limited by my resources because I'm not dependent on my resources. I'm done depending on my resources. I'm dependent on his resources. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. We pray that you were encouraged and empowered. Don't forget to check out some other messages we have on our YouTube channel and share, subscribe to thewayworldoutreach.org. We love you. God bless you. Have an amazing week.